to tell me something. Do you really like movies? Oh, really, really like movies. When's the last time you went to see a movie in a theater? You know, a movie that you really thought meant something to you. You're my little too, baby. You are listening to the Playlist Podcast. I'm your host, Eric McClanahan, and with me today is our editor in chief, Rodrigo Perez. How's it going, Rod? Good, how are you? Good, good, good. And our managing ev- editor, Kevin Yegernith. How's it going, Kevin? I'm good, man. How are you? Very good. It's uh, it's good to have you guys on. It's been a while since our last uh, podcast that, uh, you know, I thought was was a really great conversation. We got we got into some, you know, maybe some hurtful comments about Terrence Malick, and uh, <laughs> that conversation has seemed to continue a little bit over at the site. We thought we'd counter it with something uh, a little bit different uh, this this week. We're going to be talking about the summer blockbuster season uh, for 2013. I think to get started, we should talk about the most recent big, big release that that has done better than expected financially, but still isn't exactly a runaway hit, um, and that film is Pacific Rim. And I think just to get the ball rolling, I'm going to hand it off to Kevin. And why don't you just uh, let us know what what your thoughts are on the movie? Sure. Um, I didn't see it at a press screening, so I bought a ticket uh, and went yesterday afternoon. Um, I didn't go to see it in 3D for the simple fact that I cannot stand seeing movies in 3D for the most part. It's a good idea with that movie. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but you know, the thing is, like with with Pacific Rim is there's been a lot of talk about how it's the ultimate Guillermo del Toro film, how it's, you know, all of his all of his sort of, I guess, um, interests and, and, and fetishes or whatever sort of thrown up on the big screen. But I sat there watching the film and I couldn't... I was like, really? This is the film that's the ultimate del Toro movie? Like, to me, it felt so anonymous and so derivative of so many things that I just couldn't... I couldn't mesh I couldn't mesh with that idea at all you know it's uh it's really like a lot of people have said it follows the Top Gun template it follows the sort of Independence Day template it's except with monsters from the sea uh it makes very little sense uh (laughs) as a movie like I don't understand how this futuristic world or the sort of near future how the response to monsters coming from the sea is a sort of super complex Jaeger program, which seems more fraught with problems than actually working ever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think you get past the, the the concept. I mean, a lot of people, I think, just get like, "Cool, this is fun and into it," and you know, that's not a deal breaker yeah. for them. But if you can't get past that concept, the rest of the movie becomes. And not that like I was like, "Oh my god, this concept!" Like you know, no, me I, neither. I'm trying to suspend my disbelief, but. I I just say I had some. I just, well, I was just sitting there thinking. We live in the era of like drone strikes. You're mm-hmm. telling me they couldn't like just strap like some bombs to like some robot controlled planes and deal with this? And that would just seem to be more logical. Like just have instead of risking lives and spending billions of dollars making these robots that require you to neurally bridge with someone else. Right, right. Which, <laughs> which is, never which is, works. Which of uh, course gets to the point that the movie is kind of just built around the foundation of. Wouldn't it be really cool to have gigantic robots fighting against yeah. gigantic <laughs> yeah. monsters? And that's kind of the problem because, you know, uh, the movie sort of uh, contends to 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 uh, uh, show us the people, you know, the hearts and minds of the people who are responsible for fighting this war and to save humanity and give the movie movie some human context. But those people are also blandly written and so no, they're, they're, entire, they're all one dimensional and they're all devices like there's there's no character in that movie no no everyone's a, an archetype or a cipher yeah. represent one thing and you know charlie hunan is essentially maverick from top gun and and so and so it's just all this kind of half-hearted window dressing for you know monsters and robots and which, i don't even think it plays by its own rules most of the time like yes. there's, there's at one point where the monster like flies up into like outer space, and at <laughs> yes. that moment, I was like, "This movie is just ridiculous." Anyone can suspend disbelief for any world that's presented in, oh, in for sure. you know, in cinema. But once you break your own 
at least the rules we thought were presented to us, where in that scene specifically, the monster sprouts wings, raises one of these giant robots like out of you know outside the earth into space, and then conveniently they have a button where you can just hit it and a sword is launched from your yeah yeah and, yeah. and like, then, why haven't you been using that the whole time? exactly <laughs> I hate that when that happens in these kind of movies where where yeah. an amazing thing comes along later on to give you a sort of you know yeah awesome moment but yeah. really it, yeah. it undoes the logic of the film and I in my audience yesterday I just went to a regular you know screening you know with the people yesterday and the people were cheering at that moment and there's something about how <laughs> really oh it was it, to me it's wow. like you know people cheered in that as well when when the when the when the um the creature sprouted wings they cheered and when the sword came out and cheered uh, however i was at a press screening <laughs> Oh man! Gee, I don't so, know. Maybe it's an American thing. Like the audience I was with yesterday was just kind of like dead silent, and then the movie <laughs> ended, and everyone left. Like that, that was it. You well, you Canadians are much more sensible folks, so I mean, I, <laughs> maybe, I, yeah. I understand it. Uh, yeah, it was it was kind of amazing because by seeing people just you know outright just fuck yeah, like that was awesome. Like that's what people were saying right in front of me. They just forget about. I, I think the the wow moment, the money shot effect of it, just turns people's you know, the brain that makes you think about logic, the part of your brain that makes you think about logic is just out the window. And that's kind yeah, of what the, the whole movie is, you know? Yeah. I mean, on some end it, then it's sort of doing what it, 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 uh, contends to be. It's like, you know, it's, it's providing the exact escapism in a summer blockbuster that it's, it's meant to. But I guess, again, you, you got to sort of be engaged and locked in from the first, you know, few minutes or first act or whatever. And if you're not, then that stuff doesn't play. And if you do, that stuff does exactly what it should, which is just sort of provide the great kind of fun, I guess, escapism that people are expecting from this. But I feel like it's just like, I don't know, my, my, uh, I feel like the, to, to me, this movie is a triumph of design mm -hmm. because the whole design and the world and the creatures and the robots and all that stuff looks amazing. And it's extremely just, it, it's just, it's awesome. It looks so fantastic, but that's not a movie. And I will say, to the film's credit, and this is one thing I kind of appreciated, even though it's in the context of a terrible movie. Well, not terrible, but just a kind of derivative, bland movie to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I read this yesterday or the day before, but Del Toro said that he wanted to at least have like a summer action movie with like a multi-ethnic cast, where it wasn't like America saving the world, where it was... You know, sort of the world uniting and going against this whatever extraterrestrial force, yeah. and on that that I appreciated that I was like, okay, well at least in the makeup of the film cast wise, it's doing something a little different. It's just too bad it's in service of such I, an I, otherwise. I also whatever. agree that I think a, a bland multi ethnic cast is better than an American bland cast. But <laughs> <still> <laughs> well yeah. put, yeah. No, I I agree. At least uh, there was elements of this movie where I was like, yeah, it's at least a little different than what I feel like has been each film, each movie, big movie that's come out this summer. They all kind of feel like a carbon copy of the last. And it, that as much destruction as happens in this movie and as much obvious collateral damage is going on, there was, I don't know if stakes is the right way to put it, but you know, the whole world is at stake in this movie. And there's an attempt to make that a bridging between all these different countries. Whereas like, yeah, in most movies like this, it's New York that gets destroyed. I mean, I guess in a weird way, I'm like thankful that New York wasn't even shown in this movie. Looking at the cast that, that as much as I love Idris Elba, he, and he's great, I think in this movie, but he's not given, like you guys said, he's everything. Everyone's kind of one dimensional. He's just there to speechify a lot, but he's a great actor, but Charlie Hunnam, like I almost felt bad for the guy because like he's, he's British, correct? He's Australian. Australian, yeah. I just, I didn't know what kind of accent he was going for. Like, he wanted to sound like a tough guy, you know, an American. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't think he was really served at all. He didn't really have anything to work with either. Mm hmm Exactly. You know, I, I don't know who else could have really done a better job. I mean, he, his, his character is your typical doesn't listen to authority dude in every movie ever made. Yeah, but the, the also the dumb thing yeah. about that is that we're told that he's like the sort of unpredictable maverick and, you know, we're going to yeah. get us all killed. And he that doesn't – and the movie just tells you that and rarely shows you that. It shows you it a yeah. little bit in the beginning and then by the end, like, you know, if you're going – the. Uh, maybe they're trying to. Uh, this is probably giving the writer too much credit, but trying to subvert <laughs> the model. But the model is 
you're unpredictable, you're going to get us all killed, and then your unpredictability in the end is actually what, and your creativity is what saves everybody. That doesn't happen in this movie. So that, that whole thread No, and then like at the end dropped. of the movie, I mean, he basically follows orders at the end of yeah, the film. Yeah, he does. To he, save, he, to he, save he the day. He does the opposite. He sort yeah. of like shows that he can be like a team player or something like that. But the, the, that paradigm is usually supposed to be that the, what makes you unique is what saves everybody. But I don't yeah. know, whatever, I guess. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a movie like this, it's it's like you want to believe that. I mean, Guillermo del Toro is proven to be a smart director. I don't, I just don't feel like he was. I feel like his hands were tied maybe too much with this. Like it's such a big movie that like for him to really get in there and subvert and do interesting things like he has in his more personal films. Like I just feel like that opportunity wasn't there for him. And so it is strange for like Kevin. Have you been reading? Like I, I haven't even really seen that so much that that people think that this is the ultimate Del Toro film. Like I haven't really read anything too closely, but a lot of the comments I've seen have sort of said this is sort of his ultimate film in terms of allowing him to to play with monsters and and robots and and delve into those sort of things on the biggest canvas he's ever had in his career. Um, I'd not sh- I. And I think to that degree, he kind of does. I mean, I don't know how hamstrung he was. I mean, for me, he's to me, the film feels like he's told the movie he wants to tell. Mm-hmm. But I just think this is sort of the most boring version of Del Toro we can get. I mean, we've seen him do so much more interesting films. Like, if this is the ultimate Del Toro film in terms of him playing with the sort of movies that he grew up with... Uh, I mean, I guess there's an audience for that. But for me, I find it more interesting when he's telling a smaller scale story. Yeah, I mean, you look at something with, like... With actual characters. Yeah, and we, we wrote a feature just this past week about... We ranked the Del Toro films, and I'm pretty sure the top two were Devil's Backbone, and then the yeah. the, the one we ranked the top was Pan's Labyrinth. And it's like, to me, as intimate and small as those films are, they feel much bigger because so much more is at stake when you actually care about what's really going on. Whereas Pacific Rim, I, I'm to- in total agreement with you, Kevin, where it's like Pacific Rim is just big and loud and at times pretty good dumb fun. But like as a movie, I, it's not a movie. It's like it's it's I can't argue it as a good movie. I can maybe argue it's a pretty good time if you just want to shut your brain off. But I just yeah. I don't want to support that wholeheartedly because we, you know, we want good you, films. But you know what? I don't even think... I don't it's... mind turning off my brain sometimes. Yeah. I, I would... I would... Uh, I would... Uh, I'd take the first Transformers film over this. Ooh. I don't know, man. There's a no, lot. No, I totally would. Really? I mean, and I think a lot of people would last month when there was Michael Bay Appreciation Month when Pain and Gain came up. But now that that's gone, <laughs> you know, people are back to like Michael Bay's horrible. But See, I, I would... A... I think it's much more entertaining and fun, and uh, it it provides exactly what the summer blockbuster should. That's interesting, Rod, because for me, I I mean the tra- the first Transformers film is not as bad as the sequels came to be. Like, is just outright sort of insulting those movies got to be. But there's such an an ugliness and a and just you know and it, it taking a, a, an American ugliness to an extreme and all the Transformers movies that at least Pacific Rim had a like genuine heart to it that I could get behind yeah Even, there's the vulgarness in, in Bay that again everyone was celebrating last month and now yeah. everybody hates again <laughs> <laughs> well let, yeah, I mean yeah. this this conversation kind of brings up something that's been bothering me about it's kind of come up a couple times this summer where people will watch a movie and this has been and this is specifically about Pacific Rim because I've seen this a lot where they're like you know, it's not perfect, but it was really fun, so I really like it. And I find that to be the laziest way to approach a film, to to even critique a film. I think it's just, I think well, it's selling itself short and the film short. I mean, I I, I, I don't buy this... that argument at all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I, I, here's a here's the I think uh, as an uh, as a regular audience member, um, yeah, that's all you need, really. You know, um, you got to remember, like. I mean, you know, I went to go see Lone Ranger yesterday. People were on their phones. They were talking. Ugh. They don't. They don't. Audiences are different. You know, audiences are different from critics and, and movie writers. Like, you know, they want something fun, and that is good enough for them. It is. And you know, I can't argue with them. I can't argue with that being good enough for them. That's fine. I think critics and movie writers, it, it should be more. But the problem is, we live in a world where those lines of audience and 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 movie writers is pretty blurred. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They're kind of the same thing. Mm-hmm. But I mean, then what do we, it's hard because it, this is, this is the gap that seems to be getting wider between critics and audience. And when people complain on our site, you know, our commenters <laughs> uh, are, are an interesting group of people and they, 
this is what they knock us for is that we, we don't want to admit that Pacific Rim is a good movie, but we'll say like, it's good enough if, the, if this is what you want. My co-host, uh, Joe Von Oppen on another podcast I do called Adjust Your Tracking, he, he called Pacific Rim like Comic-Con the movie, you know, because it, <laughs> it feels like it's just, it, it took place at a board meeting or a pitch meeting in Comic-Con where what are all the things that would make like geeks just like, you know, wet themselves with nerd joy and it's in this movie. Yeah, no, it's true. And I mean, it's in, in a way it's fully realized. It's such, it's, it's kind of a video game more than a, than a movie in a way. Yeah. Like, and, and you know, and I just want to stress that like that concept, Comic-Con movie, the wet dream, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. As mm-hmm. long as it's a good movie and as long as it, you know, as long as there's some characters and there's some, <clears throat> I don't fault any movie for having the, the, the let's try and beat this or whatever that may be, as long as it's I, good, you know? Yeah, I mean, so. I'm not saying I'm against fun. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that <laughs> there, there's... I, I'm just saying that fun doesn't have to come at the expense of quality. Like, there can be a, a movie that's... There's a version of Pacific Rim that's awesomely fun, but that, is, that just is maybe a little bit more inventive. Like, I just sat there thinking I've seen this all before. Exactly, exactly. And That's all I'm asking for, it's just... Is there, you can have your robots, you can have your monsters, have them beat the hell out of each other. That's fine. I want to see that movie. I would love to see that movie. Mm-hmm. But what I saw, yeah, there's a smarter, there's a smarter version of this movie. Yeah, I mean, I, like, yeah. like you know, even if it, it's it's a hard comparison because it's like it's it's been done and it was done before. But Top Gun is an awesome movie. It's really entertaining. <laughs> you know, I, I think you can still uh, rip off that movie and apply it to this movie and still have it be a lot more interesting yeah. and a lot more fun. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Mm-hmm, definitely. And which is which is also gets me to the point. I don't know if you guys want to talk about this, but I think it's really I- important. Is that like you know all the campaigning towards this movie and, and people all of a sudden it's people all of a sudden r- rooting for this film because if we don't, we're not going to have any original movies. So we have to we have to get behind this movie. We have to get behind Pacific Rim because it's original. Meanwhile, none of those people are, say, rooting for, say, I don't know, Upstream Color or something that's really original. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? um, and, and, and maybe some of those same people who love sequels and reboots and, and things. Are, everyone getting behind it. We have to, we have to support original movies. That's, that was the conversation last week. And, and, yeah. and God forbid Adam Sandler can, can beat out um, mm-hmm. uh, Guillermo del Toro, the, Toro. And I don't know. I just felt that conversation was so slanted and strange especially because this movie i mean again the design the world building all that stuff is is really u- unique and interesting even though a lot it ciphers like you know a lot of or siphons a lot of different elements from like you know anime and magna mag, magna movies or, or comics and godzilla and all that stuff um but i don't see it as all that original i mean it just because it's not based on a uh, an existing property well i but, mean i think it's original to the extent that i mean it is pretty rare to see this kind of money spent on a movie with zero movie stars. Like, there's no A-list selling. There's no A-list dude selling this movie, mm-hmm. and it's also a film from a director who's never had this kind of money either. So I see the argument from that degree, and I and I see it from the angle that it's true. Movie studios do not spend like money on original concepts anymore. Very rarely, it's usually it's a TV show, a remake, a sequel. That's what our summer movies are essentially turning out to be. Yeah, absolutely. But it's just I feel like the, the original there. I mean, I guess it is original compared to say, you know, Man of Steel or or Fast and Furious and or um, Iron or Man Lone 3 Ranger and, or Lone or, Ranger or whatever yeah. summer. I guess maybe the, this summer it's like maybe it's the campaigning. more original summer blockbuster of, uh, compared to everything. Yeah. So that's relative. But I just don't find it all that original, really. No, I I mean, I agree because it's it's interesting that we're talking about this film now because it sort of bookends with was what was technically the start of the summer before Iron Man 3. I mean, Oblivion came out and didn't do that well, but that had a major star in it. And that was a quote unquote original concept. But I, I mean, the f- faults of that movie is how much it rips off so many movies that like blatantly rips off movies that have come before it even in the last five ten years you know mm-hmm. and i it's a shame that these are the original movies that like people just want to champion in a sort of political stance sort of way like what you're talking about rod and i just wish i mean as much as i really loved inception and i believe both of you are big fans of that film as well i mean that movie also is original but has it's also borrowing elements from familiar things, and I guess that's kind of like right. I mean, the we, best we, we can, can help for. I, I mean, guess. we can argue, we can argue like the degree of originality until the end of time. But I mean, 
I think I, don't, I think we're. I mean, I think we should be a little bit loose with the term. I mean, I think we're just talking about original in the sense that it's not something that the average moviegoer would have heard of before. Yeah. And I, like, even if we know what Oblivion is ripping off, I guarantee you, like, 75% of that audience doesn't know what it's ripping off. Oh, totally. The funny thing is is that uh, all those things, Oblivion, uh, Pacific Rim, and, and here's where it differs from Inception or, say, Looper. Um, Oblivion and Pacific Rim are built to create uh, sequels and franchises. That is um, true. If they would have done well enough, you'd see sequels. Even Oblivion, which kind of ends closed-ended, has enough of an open ending that... It could it could point to sequels if it had made enough money. It didn't make enough money, uh, and same thing with Pacific Rim. Whereas Inception and Looper, those things are closed. Those stories are are ended. Those the protagonists are are you know one in one movie the pro- protagonist dies, mm-hmm. the other one he essentially like I don't know you know he uh, whatever you know it's the ending of the Inception like his <laughs> morality is is closed or whatever. But uh, um, those movies aren't built to uh, to to have sequels and, and, and other films. And I think that's where they, that's where the originality, uh, line right. differs for me because it's like these things that are, are closed ended. These are just True. a story that someone wanted to tell that was ambitious. These other things are geared for, you know, but Travis though, Beecham, right. the writer of, of Pacific Rim is already on Twitter being like, you know, I can't wait for the sequel if it happens. Uh, True. But those are also anomalies like Christopher Nolan. He really only got to make in, make inception because the dark of Knight. the Dark Knight, or mm-hmm. because of the success of those films, and mm-hmm. and Looper was independently financed for the most part. So those are also anomalies to studio-made films to a certain degree. Sure. Yeah. I mean, even District Nine, I I think of as well. I mean, that that's an anomaly where it's like, how did he get to make this movie that looked so gorgeous? That was also that was also financed outside of the studio as well. And he had the help of, I mean, Peter Jackson said, this is the guy, this is the horse that I'm picking, you know, and he probably mm-hmm. got a lot of benefits with that. You know, you have to assume, but I mean, there, there's a film that maybe we can look towards as something that could be much more original and just stand out is, is Elysium, you know, the new film from Neil Blomkamp coming in. When is it coming? August 9th? 9th. Yeah. Sometime I mean, in, in August. Yeah. Are you guys? The, are you guys? That's getting the excited? only. Yeah. That's the only film left of the summer. I kind of am looking forward to outside of uh, maybe the Woody Allen movie. Outside of those two. Oh, yeah, kinda, in terms of summer blockbusters, done. that's probably yeah. The, uh, Splark- yeah. Yeah. That's that, probably the only one, really. I know, and I'm I. It's the one I've been look most looking forward to, and I mean, I got to stop watching trailers for it because I, I'm, I'm getting too excited. I think, but it looks it looks great, and. I guess it's directors like that who at least are going to have this vision and fight for it because we've done a lot of reporting on how Neil Blomkamp is, he doesn't want to do a Star Wars movie. He doesn't want to get thrown into that franchise world and he's going to keep doing, hopefully he can keep doing his thing because he seems like a guy with a voice, but also a vision. At the edge of our hope, at the end of our time, we have chosen not only to believe in ourselves, but in each other. Today, there's not a man nor woman in here that shall stand alone. Today, we face the monsters that are at our door. Today, we are canceling the apocalypse. What do you guys think of the endings of all these movies this summer? And maybe this is just something that happens every summer, but like, I feel like the mass destruction of a city is just so tired at this point. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, that's what happens when you have yeah. these yeah. big movies. You know, everything's but like... why does uh, it have to happen that way, you know? Like, give us something. Like, mix it up. Like, I, I have to admit, I, I mostly enjoyed Man of Steel despite a lot of flaws. But, like, that movie was was exhausting it was i was tired by the end yeah the ending the ending is is uh you know i for sure Mm -hmm. i don't have a problem with cities being destroyed i just have a problem with cities being destroyed without the emotional context or any social context to go with it where it's just like or like i saw star trek finally on friday Mm -hmm. and like the end of that movie whatever the enterprise crashes into, like it lays waste to it crashes into a city and then Spock and dude run around (laughs) jumping through glass windows, jumping on these like airships and battling each other. And, but there's like no consequence. Then the movie ends. And and I think 
I just want to see a consequence. If you're going to lay waste to a city, then you need to have you need to the earn thing that is, right. The thing is, yeah. it's the exploitation of 9/11-esque, yeah, you yes. know, post 9/11-esque fears, and you know, Vulture did that article on that kind of idea, and it's true. It's like you know, it's it's a cheap, hollow way of of creating like. Wow, stakes! Oh my God, look at all these cities. Look at all, and in your mind, you're like, look at all these people that are being, um, they're like, look, oh my God, that whole building got wiped out. And even though it's not expressed in the movie, in the back of your head, you're like, even if you may not think of it, you're subconsciously even for three seconds going, wow, that's 300 people that are dead. And you know, carnage, carnage, carnage. So that's the the cheap sort of. Um, exploitation and and, and uh, leveraging of like that idea where it's like you know it's it's sort of like fear and destruction and oh my god and this movie's so big and da 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 it's sort of this, this subconscious like wow everything's so big and and I think in many many ways to them that's like that that uh, you know maybe. I don't know if fun is the right word, but it creates like, wow, this is such a big, epic movie and stuff like that. But yeah, of course, there's no – it's that's why I call it exploitation because it's it's simply using all well, no, that it, stuff and, yeah, and, and right. it, there's, it, there's nothing it, else to it. It just it, it just exploits that. Well, it plays that on that nine, post-9-11 kind of fear and whatever as spectacle. Oh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's at, yeah, to me, it's exactly. at odds It's at odds with the sort of self-seriousness of a film like Man of Steel where – it wants to be taken seriously, but if you're not going to show us the actual consequences, like, okay, you can show us Lawrence Fishburne running from a building that's falling, but like, there was not enough, there wasn't enough work put into those characters in that movie for me to actually care enough, you know. And I just feel like this this sort of destruction and hearkening back to 9/11 imagery is a lazy sort of shorthand yeah, to get absolutely. to, like, yeah, and the exploitation of it just. I don't know. I guess I'd rather take a someone who's just like like an old seventies exploitation movie that knows what it's doing is exploiting something and kind of has fun with that idea, or at least right. felt more fun, even though something could be really sleazy, you know? Like right, but you also have to remember back in the seventies, like, something like nine eleven was like inconceivable, yeah, so they had a bit more a leeway point. in that regard. So now, I think filmmakers just have a bit more responsibility that if you're going to show a building collapsing as the World Trade Center did. You need to have some responsibility for what you're showing, and you can't just show it because it's a kind of a hey, cool moment that mm-hmm. our heroes are going to use to rebound from to save the world or whatever. That you're going to have a bit more thought to what you're doing. Uh, this trend that's been really like going full bore this summer is just really, in hindsight, is making me appreciate uh, Steven Spielberg's uh, War of the Worlds like way more. In in hindsight, like problems that movie may have, it was. Unless I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong. Kind of the first big summer tentpole movie to throw not not throw 9/11 in your face, but all of the image was was making you relate it to the things that the horrible things we saw on actual TV in reality, and they used it in that film. But that film, like you see the consequences, you see people die. Like it's just. It's kind of amazing that movie's rated PG thirteen when you think about the the sort of I mean. Carnage. There's also an emotional. There's an emotional. Um through line with that with the family and all that stuff that that makes um as much as i find that movie's uneven too and the ending is really anticlimactic and terrible but yeah yeah, there's an emotional through line that makes all that stuff work all that imagery doesn't isn't just doesn't feel in 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 exploitative service of of the spectacle there's there's a point to it there's a there's an emotional this guy's got to get to his family there's you Mm -hmm. know people there's there's a lot of emotional stakes and that's what i think people forget in these action movies is that they just put in dramatic stakes without any uh emotional texture there that that makes it pretty different the lone ranger came out a couple weeks ago it uh it did not perform that well and it's a very expensive movie very expensive yeah movie. It's, it's turning into uh I, I feel like do you guys feel like um uh, uh interestingly enough it's sort of been it's Flopness, its bombness has sort of been uh, underreported as uh, in comparison to John Carter, maybe because in John Carter, it was so everybody knew that movie was going to bomb, like your mom knew, because it was like, oh, John Carter was marketed so horribly. It was like, I feel like there was a chorus of two or three months before John Car- Carter came out that I feel like everyone, you know, like everybody knew that that movie was. But going also, to, that quote, film unquote, bomb. had a very public terrible production to go with it so it was ah but was so did world war z the, world war z had the same thing and that didn't happen but it had a longer yeah, recovery it had a longer recovery period i think and mm. also 
uh, yeah, I, I think that film had a longer recovery period where there was a, there was the reporting of it, like of it being a troubled production, and then a year passed, and then it came out. Yeah. Whereas, whereas John Carter, I think it was like may, maybe six or eight months before the New Yorker sort of had this big piece about what a disaster the movie making was, and then it just sort of spiraled out from there. Also, John Carter came out in the spring when there was not nearly the competition that there is in the summer. And I remember thinking that, like, man, that, that's an interesting choice to put a movie that looks clearly like a summer movie out in, in like, what, March or April? And, you know, I, I feel like that really got started with um, Zack Snyder's 300, where that movie was such a massive success and didn't seem like a movie that would come out at that time. Right now, and, March has become this sort of new sort of... I think pre, what, what pre- wasn't so- even... Yeah, yeah. Go I don't ahead, even think it was three hundred. I think it was Alice in Wonderland when it did a billion dollars opening in the there spring. There you go. There you go. Yeah, Everyone. but actually, three hundred did was a huge hit at that time, and it started the right. precedent. Although I think you can even look back further and and, and see yeah. lots of. And I love I love that idea of like let's open it up. Like I love the idea that now August isn't just the dumping ground. Like, and I think like people like Neil Blomkamp are to thank for that because why not put your movie out in the time where it's oh. not going to get you know where it's going to get uh, buried. Uh, by each no, uh, I don't know. August is still kind of dumping ground. Yeah, the it last is, two weeks of August are like a disaster. <laughs> it's like a nightmare of releases. <laughs> and and just because uh, just because uh, you know Elysium and say you know um, uh, huh. D- the World's not. End are in August doesn't mean that they're going to do well. That's you know? true. The, that's the, true. the other reason you released in August is simply because you're you're not going to have as much competition either. But like that's the thing that they could benefit from, like even expanding like these movies out, like give them a movie like The Lone Ranger maybe could do better at a different release period. But it's like nope, it has to come out in the summer. And then if the movie doesn't do well, which it really didn't, it's buried by the next big thing, which in this case is you know what grown up grown ups two or like you know uh pacific rim and then whatever's coming out right. next week what did you guys think of the lone ranger because <laughs> i hated that movie i didn't hate it i just thought it was completely misguided in its approach oh yeah um i i think that the problem with the film i, I wrote the review for the site but mm-hmm. the problem with the film is that it approaches the entire endeavor as if it's the first part of like a longer series and so we spend most of, of an overly long two and a half hours Oof. building the sort of, I guess, mythology of these characters. But, like, for me, the fun the fun of the Lone Ranger would be to go see them actually teaming up. But, like, they don't really get together until the last half hour of the film, and it's a big train chase. And just the actual story itself is just so boring. It's just boring. I just found it kind of dull, and, like, I don't really... I didn't really get involved in the whole, like, scheme to, like, take land from, I guess, the Indians and all mm. this... Uh, I don't know. I just thought it was dull. It was the approach sort of took for granted that it was going to be a franchise. And I don't know. I, I, I didn't hate it. I just thought the approach was wrong. And I, I just found it kind of uninvolving. I completely, completely agree. I like this movie. You can't hate it because it's just so dull. You can't. <laughs> it's not it's not hateable. Like, yeah. I think you gave it a see something. And I think that's really that's really fair. There's, I, there's almost nothing I hated about this movie, but there's absolutely nothing that involved me. Yeah. It is so dull and so boring, and it tells a story in two and a half hours that it can never engage you. Um, I thought Johnny Depp was kind of fun, even though he's a little bit goofy. And there's a couple moments that are like you know that I think are meant for like uh, uh, kids were laughing in my uh, audience, and I kind of was rolling my eyes a little bit. But I was still yeah. sort of enjoying that a little bit. But the rest of the movie is just like Army Hammer is is, is, is a charisma vacuum, and uh, <laughs> uh, it's just there's. You know, I thought that train little piece at the end was that that thing was so ridiculous. It was fun, and I wanted more. I wanted more of like a you know, I it's the from the, essentially from the makers of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, yeah, which yeah, are terrible. Yeah. But the first one is still really enjoyable and really fun, and yeah, uh, you know, it's a it's a good. I hate to use the word ride because that's what's built on, but the, you know, it's a it's a it's a good, enjoyable, entertaining blockbuster, mm-hmm. um, and that's what I was hoping to get from this. And it's so bloated in this, you know, this yes. this dumb framing device. And, oh yes. Oh Can, my god. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Trend it, number two that needs to die in movies, and this isn't just summer movies, is fucking bookending your movie to give it from like a future time, and then yeah. somebody telling the story like that trend. I mean, to me, like. 
the a bad example or a big example that I always go back to with that is like Saving Private Ryan. Like, why does that movie need the framing device? Like, it would be yeah. shorter, it'd be leaner, it'd be a better movie, and it still tell. It's like uh, it's an it's not having the faith in the audience to fucking follow yeah. this very basic story yeah. that's going on. And yeah. literally in the Lone Ranger, where and this is this is something I hated about this movie is that. I started getting involved at times in the movie through the action or whatever might be happening, or sometimes through Johnny Depp's comedy, but then I would be deflated. I'd be deflated by this little kid going, wait a minute. Like <laughs> you, you, you're was, lying. And it cuts it, back to the story. Yeah. It's completely frame. unnecessary. It was like really, it, uh, it makes the movie so long and did it add, it added nothing to the movie, you know? And I just feel like there's this false oddly, sense of epicness through runtime in, in these movies that, yeah, that ridiculous. works completely against it. I mean, imagine that movie was like, a little bit over 90 minutes like it could have oh. been and they really condensed it maybe it would have been kind of fun you know like i said if it, if it had just been the two of them going spending even like two hours going on like on an adventure i would like to see that movie what i don't want to see is the movie we got which is two and a half hours of them explaining how they decided to become a team <laughs> like i like i don't care about that story like and it's and it, like like you said it, it's just totally told in the dullest way possible and I think the the weird thing is is we had an interview with Gore Verbinski on the site, mm-hmm. and he fought for that framing device. He oh it was God. his idea, and he wanted it in the film because he wanted to tell the movie from Tonto's perspective. But he does it in the most literal, boring way possible, oh. which is having Tonto tell the story to this shitty little kid who's <laughs> annoying. <laughs> Yeah, and the I think the, the the shame of that is I actually think Gore Verbinski is a very talented like director with like vision. Like this dude, yeah, like, absolutely. His movies look great. Like Lone Ranger is nothing. You know what? That's why I can't say I think the movie's outright terrible because my God, is it gorgeous? And I feel like it his biggest, cool. yeah, as big as his budgets are in these movies and are getting with each subsequent film in his career, like the money does seem to be all up on the screen. Yeah, and, and that's great. And the that's... same with the pirates movies for the most part, although they start to get CGI and retarded and ridiculous. But you know, that <laughs> yeah. first movie is like the same way. It's like You're right. It's a, like it's all that money is up there, and there's a lot of spectacle and it, there's a lot of fun vision. Like you know, he's Michael Bay esque in that way. Yeah. Um, he can really make a mean blockbuster. That's true. Well, and Lord knows if yeah, but I mean, we'll see if he gets this kind of money anytime soon. After Lone Ranger, yeah, sort of a what have you well, done for the me lately? Thing is, he like you know he made. Two westerns back to back. It's just that Rango was a Rango's, hell of a lot better. Oh, Rango's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah, Rango's great. Rango's really, really fun. And that's your if you really want like a, a Gonzo little animated, you know, adventure, man. That's the one. That that watch. I mean, I, Kevin, I don't know if you've seen it, but like if you're disappointed with, um, well, no, I've seen Rango. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like you know, go. That's the movie to see if you're, you're right. disappointed with Little Ranger. Like that. If only awesome. he had brought that sort of sense of like zaniness to this movie. There's an, such attempt. A movie. there's an attempt because there's these weird little moments in Lone Ranger where like one of the uh, henchmen to a, a, a really great William Fichtner uh, villainous performance in this movie. But one of his henchmen uh, likes dressing in women's clothes and they give that two minutes yeah. in the movie. And then there's all this there's you know, talk of the weird things in it. And they're all so like, like Perfunctory. super half hearted. Mm-hmm. Like there's a, Oh yeah, this guy likes women's clothing, and like, but it's like barely there. And there's these like strange yes. like rabbits that devour something oh for a second. God, the and it's like it's there for four seconds, and like I know and some people have talked about this movie so weird and so strange, and I'm like, I don't think so. Like this is pretty like standard operating procedure, like blockbuster with a, a you know PG thirteen blockbuster with a few few small little things here and there but like hardly you know the movie could you know, have been weirder it could have been weirder yeah honestly i just came out of the lone ranger thinking i would have loved to see uh gore verminsky just do a straight up adult western yes like give him half the money and just send him off to go make a straight up western that'd probably be a much better experience than that was than the lone yeah. ranger yeah no i agree and i just wish he would have pushed he has a weird sensibility and i wish like you go as far back as something like mouse hunt which i actually think is a really really interesting fun little movie that he made um which is like a live action cartoon which is essentially what the lone ranger is and i would love to see i, I guess i just wished more of his weird sensibility would have been put in there because they tried it's certainly there in the scenes that we just referenced and like even the idea of the um 
the the unreliable narrator that is Tonto telling the story in the Lone Ranger has like there's an attempt to give you some weird elements to it because I don't know if you guys remember this moment where he's burying the dead bodies that uh, early in the film Tonto is yeah. mm-hmm. and he throws a bag of popcorn on one of them. He always takes something from the carcass mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and he th- gives something back. There's this weird moment where he throws a bag of popcorn at as his trade. And it's like, mm-hmm. wait a minute, that's totally anachronistic. And that's from the time of the story that he's, t- you know, that's from yeah. the night. Mm-hmm. And I wish they would have pushed things like that more where it's like, Oh, he's an unreliable narrator. I just feel like these, like, again, you know, these weird moments, I suppose they're there, but man, are they really neutered? Like, it's like, it's like maybe they were there a little bit more. And then it went through the Disney, like PG 13 shears or something. And like, yeah. cause it's like, it's, barely there and even at pg-13 like watching the film like there's some pretty oh yeah violent graphic stuff in there and i'm like i don't like if i had a kid who was like six years old i don't know if i would take them to that film you know there's like a dude eating like organs and there's scalpings and there's mass genocide <laughs> like yeah it's a little odd in that regard for a disney movie anyway it, it gets into the a similar problem with world war z where um and we've talked about this uh with both of these films is there is the PG-13 rating is a hindrance because it's like they insist on it because it gives you a bigger audience, a bigger yield, a, b- a bigger box office draw. But these movies are being neutered where, honestly, like, yeah, William Fichtner eats a guy's heart in this movie. But how would I have known that? Like, I don't see the consequences of that. I see the looks on people's faces. And I, I think it actually goes to show how talented uh, Christopher Nolan is at masking violence in the Dark Knight movies. Like, especially mm-hmm. du- the Dark Knight. Like, that's a brutally violent movie. But almost in this weird sort of 70s era Texas Chainsaw Massacre where, like, you don't see the violence, but you think you saw it. And he's much more clever than just cutting away like they do in The Lone Ranger or World Mm -hmm. War Z. You know, it's like a person gets their freaking hand, like, instantly cut off. And we, I mean, I just wish, like, it's like you can't show it because they insist on it being PG-13. And it's just making these movies not, it's, it's, the potential for these movies is so much grander if they would just maybe have the balls to go with an R rating, but I guess that just feeds into the, the, the business model that they got in place. Yeah. But again, at the same time, like you said, I feel like R PG 13, eh, I don't know if it really matters that much. Like I think like you just pointed out a great example that no one can, can do R rated movies in PG 13. And I think there's been lots of examples of that. Um, so it just takes an artful filmmaker, you know, even that, right. even with world war Z, it didn't bother me much that it wasn't R. I mean, if it was R rated, what would we get a bit more gore? Is yeah, that movie exactly. served a bit like, better by Gore? Uh, I don't know. Not really. I mean, the movie is about yeah. this dude trying to get back to his family. I mean, it's a procedural at, the, at its heart. At its heart. So I don't know if I need to see brains everywhere necessarily. Yeah, yeah. that's that's fair enough. That's fair enough. But the Lone Ranger like wallows in its <clears throat> in its pretty grim violence for for so much of it that. And and it also it's another movie that as fun as it wants to be and light as it wants to be, it wants to tell a story that's kind of serious, like uh, building it around you know some actual history that happened in this country with like genocide of of Indians and like the you know the way we just took over this land you know and that to me is is not nearly as effective as they want it to be because they're no, not I willing agree. to show you the consequences. Yeah. yeah. Well, I find it kind of totally jar- jarring in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that genocide thing is heartbreaking actually. It's like really like god, this is so awful. Um yeah. but it, it's like doesn't belong in that movie. You want me to wear a mask? The men you seek think you are dead, Kimosabi. Better to stay that way. All right, but if we ride together, it's to bring these men to justice in a court of law. Is that understood? Justice is what I seek, Kimosabe. Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, um, we reported on this at least a few weeks ago. They they were at USC, if I'm remembering correctly, and there was a new like wing opening up to the film school there. Sure. And, and <laughs> these two, you know, uh, if there was a Mount Rushmore in Hollywood, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas head would they 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 would be plastered on that Mount Rushmore, right? These are like mm-hmm. the titans of of Hollywood, and they kind of said like it's all going to shit, and in, in you know to paraphrase basically 
And Spielberg specifically said that there's going to be a sort of, there's a bubble that's growing and it's going to burst. And he sees like four or five, maybe six of these massive movies that are all just going to bomb in the way that the Lone Ranger basically has. And in some ways Pacific Rim maybe has, but you know, maybe we can get into that further, but what do you guys think about that? Like what, what's going to be the result if that does happen? Um, what do you foresee happening in Hollywood if, if something like that were to happen? Well, I mean, my first question is, is what, what, you know, they're, they're, they're in, uh, essentially prophesizing or speculating about a, a ceiling or, or if I remember, recall reg- correctly what they said something about you know an implosion because of you know blockbusters or whatever right like this the industry sort of collapsing on itself and i don't know if that'll actually come to pass unless audiences reject summer blockbusters i don't think you're going to have an implosion like that within the system if um, unless there's a, a massive rejection of um of, of blockbusters and, and i think you'd have to have a lot of bombs you'd have to like I, i've been thinking of it in terms of like um, what shakes up every industry? Well, like, you know, like, you know, Nirvana and, and Pulp Fiction were mm. two, uh, sort of big touchstones in, in, in my lifetime in the nineties when they both, you know, shook up the, the music industry and the, 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 the film industry, both in, in, you know, within two or three years of one another. Um, they're both, you know, the opposite of, um, of, of, of big, they were, they were, you know, uh, you know, they're they're sort of like almost a a, a, a total a, a antidote to to the the bigger movies. You know, Nirvana was grungy and 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 sort of this alternative angry sort of thing, and not the pop music that was out. It was a rejection of like Guns and Roses, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Pulp Fiction was was very different from all the uh, all the, the the movies at the time, and so I think for this sort of prediction to happen i think you would need a similar kind of big big time gear shift to happen Mm -hmm. um where audiences sort of reject one thing and latch onto another thing like you can even go you know like pulp fiction is right around the time of uh last action hero which was a huge bomb and then you know you have something like pulp fiction is a huge hit and then that sort of uh readjusts the the paradigm of that industry and then people start chasing the tail of something new which was pulp fiction that's why you get a zillion pulp pulp fiction um esque movies so um I, again you know you, you need flops and and uh you know i was having this conversation on, on twitter with um a, a bunch of filmmakers i'm not going to drop names because it sounds stupid <laughs> but uh uh you know they were sort of lamenting you know original ideas and and blockbusters and things like that and and uh and and i was like i you know i don't know if anything's going to change i mean it's like to me uh, i said it was sort of a bit of a vicious cycle like studios provide these things for audiences and audience flock to these things in droves yeah. so yeah. so uh, there uh, in that that um that symbiotic relationship is in my mind doing really well i mean sure there's a, there's the few uh, there's the few um um uh, flops there's the lone ranger there's the john carter but um, for every one of those, there's 10 films that do really, really well. So I, I feel like the, the, the relationship between studios and audiences, which is very different from the relationship with, say, people like us, we're not the, we're not the people that studios make movies for. Um, our audience probably isn't to some degree. Um, and, and so I, th- I think that's, that's going the way it's going, and, and I don't know if they're going to fully re- – I mean, I guess you could look at Pacific Rim. It only did $38 million, which isn't huge business, but – but it's but it's number one overseas and right right and, it'll and, it, it'll make its money back in some way or another and I, I think I think Rod sort of hit it right on the head. I mean, it is a vicious cycle. Audiences go to these movies, and because they go to these movies, the studios keep making them. And yeah. I think you know I think there's there will be a tipping point at some point. Like all I have to do is is look at like 2015 is going to be a ridiculous year because we're getting <laughs> Fantastic Four reboot, Independence Day sequel, Ugh. Pirates 5, Star Wars 7, Bond 24, uh, <laughs> The Smurfs 3, uh, the finale of Hunger Games, Jurassic Park 4, potentially. <sighs> so, 
Dude, I you think, just you bummed me out just if, now. If, but I mean, that's the year, but, <laughs> yeah, you know, but like but that. But, I mean, that's a big year for a lot of reasons because mm-hmm. it, it's a lot of sequels and reboots and the Avengers too. I forgot about. Oh Jesus! Which are all coming within twelve months. So on the one hand, it might seem silly because it's just like, well, is this really what we're getting? But on the other hand audiences have asked for this financially because they've gone to these movies yeah. and made them successes and now the studios are responding in kind now whether or not the audience by that time is like well we've had enough of this and starts rejecting some of these major sequels then we'll see what happens but even then like when we're talking flops like even Lone Ranger and Pacific Rim I don't think will end up being sort of John Carter sized flops Yeah, where I mean, I mean a studio Lone will Ranger have to be three. financially threatened to the point of like where they would stop operating, where I think they were, were that they would change their game plan because yeah, by and exactly. large their game plan is working right now. They, they're not every movie is going to hit, and so they'll take one on the chin if it means five more are going to make a billion yeah, dollars. Absolutely, you're, you're right. It'd have to get so bad that they'd have to like be in trouble, and that's not happening. Every like one one big flop for you know twelve successes is not going to change anyone's business model, and you know it's ironic the. Uh, I mean, maybe because I think what those guys are uh, Spielberg and Lucas are like are are intimating at is is that like it's funny that the the, the Pacific Rim motto is go big or go home, and that's the studio model, you know, go big or go home. It's uh-huh. like and and maybe what they're saying is that like well, everything is built upon these gigantic risks. You do you go really big and you make big money, and if you don't, you 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 completely flop. There's very little. There's very little middle ground there, well, that's, and that's their model. You know, but that's, you have to remember too that studios are also they're not taking as much financial risk anymore because they're often partnering with multiple companies mm-hmm. to even produce these films. So they're even there's they're like we have to remember they're smart. Like they may seem like from the outside to be kind of like, well, why are we getting a sequel to Red Two? <laughs> well, I mean, the reason we're getting a sequel is because it's not that much to produce. The first one did decent enough business. And they'll probably make a nice little toddy profit on the back end of this one, too, if people go, which I don't think they will. But there's yeah. a reason these things happen. And I think the studios are actually – they can be smarter than we take them – that we give them credit for. Yeah. I oh, mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean I think that that's the one part of the conversation that sort of bothers me is that like everyone's always like – uh, you know, oh god damn, another sequel, another this, another that. That's all we ever hear is like they're so Hollywood's so unoriginal or, or or there's no creative ideas in Hollywood. It's like why does there need to be? <laughs> they make so much money. You guys go <laughs> keep seeing this stuff. Why should they reinvent the wheel? Exactly. If like you know if like like this car, this this it's like, do we need to update this model? Nah, it's selling really well. Like, do we, do we need to invest a whole bunch of money to, to, to improve the, this automobile on the market? No. You know, our, our, our cost end is this much, and, and we should not why, – why bother? It's not, you know, it's not yeah. broke. I think what, Spiel, what Spielberg was getting into, though, with what he was saying, I think, is the car industry in this country took a big hit not too long ago. And, like, maybe he's saying that if you get – if that culture of laziness, of just regurgitation, which is – which is, you guys are absolutely right. It's working. Like, that's why they keep doing that. But is there going to be a tip point, tipping point where people just reject these movies? And if so, like – I, you know what? You're. I really like the point you made where it, it needs to be a, a film itself that's like a game changer. Yeah, in a, in a yeah, bold yeah, way. Exactly. And we need an Easy Rider, or we need a Pulp Fiction. Well, I mean, to you really just have to look along. at what happened in the '90s. Like Pulp Fiction came out and like completely changed the landscape. Every studio launched an independent division, mm-hmm. and those right. independent yeah. divisions lasted until they stopped making money and they were all closed. Yeah. And then now we have the culture we have now. So I, I think it's cyclical. I mean, yeah, the blockbuster cycle will last as long as it lasts. It'll. I think it's going to be here for a while and then something else will come along and the studios will, will adapt to that because audiences taste will change. Yeah. And Soderbergh got into uh, Steven Soderbergh in a, a video we've, we've posted on the website uh, a couple months ago where he was at the San Francisco international film festival. And he had a very, very interesting, uh, you know, almost rant as a speech, but he being Steven Soderbergh, it was very well articulated. Um, you t- I just tend to agree with so much of what that guy's saying. I find him fascinating. And he was going on, on about how the studios would rather just – they they're gamblers. They want to play the biggest bet because it's it offers the biggest rewards. And it's mm-hmm. not – and yeah. the, the shame of that is we lose – those middle movies now the movies that tend to be for adults and i think there is an audience for adults in summer movies but like they're just not being they're not being nurtured in in the way that at least not by the studios yeah well and and 
it doesn't behoove them to go after that. It doesn't like yeah. Oscars and all that stuff doesn't really matter anymore, at least not to them. It doesn't drive the kind of business that it used to. Mm-hmm. Um, that that prestige means nothing in the end, really. So like why again, you know, it's a business. Like why why change their their model? This is working, it's making big money. Um, so then we just have to, you know, look at other studios that that have different profit margins and, and operate in different ways and they're smaller st- films uh, studios so, so they have to create smaller films so we have to look at the like you know there's always going to be I, I know people are always like oh my god the, the sky is falling you know there's going to be no more <laughs> you know there's only going to be big movies but I think there's always going to be a Fox Searchlight or a Magnolia or a Roadside's Attraction or whatever these you know CBS Films is fairly new and they're doing kind of mid-sized you know, films, you know, mm-hmm, they mm-hmm. did the Coen brothers. There's, uh, there's always Sony classics. There's, that's always going to be there. And I think those two are always going to coexist. So I don't really see. Yeah. And I think we often, change. yeah. I mean, the other thing we have to remember is I, I said this earlier, but like these like Warner brothers, whatever, they're major corporations. And if you're a studio yeah. executive and you want to move up the ladder, you're not moving up the ladder by putting together a film for 30 million that will make 50 million mm-hmm. you're going to move up that ladder if you spend 100 million dollars and it makes 700 million dollars that's your career you've just you know you've proven mm-hmm. yourself and and you get to move on to do bigger better things and i think rod is totally right we're going to have there's always going to be those sort of niche studios i think i mean i think seeing those films is going to be tougher in multiplexes yeah but uh, that's just the well, way it that's goes. Why I mean, world, that, that's why the world is going towards you know video on demand and streaming and things like that. And yeah. maybe we're gonna, we're, maybe the future is gonna be you're only gonna the movies that you're really gonna see in theaters in in theaters are gonna be blockbusters and everything else yeah. like is gonna be streamed to your home and you're not like the canyons or something like that. Uh-huh. In like in five years, the only option to see that is is uh, is at home unless so, you're or, unless you're in. A- in a major city, I think, though, right, you know, right. like, which, which yeah. has already happening as it is. It is. Because, you're right. You're right. That model's uh, in place. You know, a lot of the, yeah, that, that model is in place. And, you, you know, when the Canyons opens up, where is it going to be in theaters? Where are you going to be able to see that? Probably New York and, and L.A. And then it probably will expand um, to different cities. Like, when will you get it in Portland? I don't know, but I doubt you're going to get it first opening weekend, right? Yeah, you're right. You're right. But there um, will be a theater that'll pick that film up because. Right, eventually, yeah. eventually, mm-hmm. like, it'll, it'll expand. And if those uh, if those those you know um, financial margins get smaller and smaller and smaller um, as time goes by and, and this divide increases, um, may, maybe maybe you won't eventually see like maybe that maybe that movie in, in a few years wouldn't come to Portland or um, uh, or, or maybe there's only going to be a handful of, of of those theaters that exist that that do that sort of thing. There's always going to be that. Again, even like the little studio, there's always going to be, you know, people like vinyl. There's always going to be mm-hmm. some someone who's going to try and, you know, cater to the sort of true audience or the the cinephile, the the the, the real movie goer. You know, I think that'll always ex- exist. But yeah, it it may it may um, dwindle more and more and, and become more of a, a a home experience. Ironically. Or not so ironically, I guess it's very similar to television, where the quality is is, is really great. We're going through a, a, like a golden age of of television, where it's about characters and story and, and things like that, and and that's at home. You know, you enjoy it at home, you digest it at home, you can go through a whole series or whatever. Um, and and I think the, the the a lot of the smaller independent movies have a similar mindset, similar um, uh, similar goals in their storytelling. And then, but you're right, and. I wonder, I, I guess I've seen just in Portland alone, several art house theaters that have survived in this town by, by, uh, scaling down. Like they, they, there's a, there's a great theater in town that only plays, you know, like right now it's playing the Joss Whedon, um, much ado about nothing. Mm-hmm. And they're adding two new screens to this one old fashioned one screen house. And it's amazing. It's like kind of mind blowing that they're able to do that. But what they're doing is building micro cinemas, 50 seats, 80 seats. Yeah. And mm-hmm. they do that. They can sell out, um, Francis yeah, Ha. Those are, they can play those Francis are starting Ha to do, for weeks. Do, you know. do really well. Yeah, in uh, in in Brooklyn, a bunch of uh, theaters like that are starting to pop up all over the place. Where yeah, the theater. I was in. I saw the East a few weeks ago mm-hmm. with Simon Dang. I don't remember Simon Dang. Oh, shout out yeah, to, yeah. To our, shout out to our old Australian writer. We went and saw the East, and uh, I, I swear that theater held 
25 people, 30 people, or probably less. Yeah. And what did you think of the people. experience, Rod? Like, it's it's kind of great. I like oh, it. Oh, yeah, no, it's totally, it's totally great. It was, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's very much like the Alamo Draft House where, you know, mm-hmm. you got food and everything. It's much more catered to, like, the, you know, cinephile. And, uh, no, it's a great experience. It's But, you know, the people that are only going to attend those things are because the type of movies they play are, are, are real movie lovers who, I don't know, you know, it's not about – uh, spectacle and things like that. You're right. And I mean, one of my favorite, I mean, my definitely one of my favorite films of this year so far, and just the, uh, an experience I enjoyed so much in the theater <clears throat> that I've seen it four times is upstream color. And just getting to see that in a theater with what to me was mind blowing was a full audience. Every time I saw it full yeah, audience, that's encouraging. That's that cool. is very encouraging. And that film, you also live in Portland though. I do, yes. Yes. <laughs> Portland's to, like, you know, there's a whole television show about how <laughs> different that city is from the rest of the country. And it's not that exaggerated, that TV show. I mean, right, those, right. Yeah, those people exist. Uh, you're right. So that is true. You got to put that context in there. But it was encouraging because that film is challenging. But to me, that's the biggest movie I've seen this year. You know, like it's scale, it's vision. It's a, mm-hmm. it's presented as a small, low budget movie. But to me, that movie's huge. It's about everything. Well, and, it's got some fantastic, huge ideas for sure. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. Yeah, and I just, I just love that. You know, if if those are the movies that will survive and hopefully still get played in theaters, I guess you're right. Like the model that's existing right now, and that you know theaters are adapting to, that distributors are adapting to, maybe is not as dire and apocalyptic as you know a lot of people tend to make it out to be because being hyperbolic tends to get more you know attention for you online. Right. Well, I mean, also, you know, Spielberg and Lucas, I don't think we're trying to be hyperbolic. I'm sure that's they um, I, I'm sure they uh, have a, a genuine feeling and, and, and probably lament in many ways. Like, you know, Spielberg uh, put made Lincoln and Lincoln almost had to be done on HBO because, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he didn't think he was going to get the studio behind it. And he thought he would have to release it on uh, HBO. Not that there's anything wrong with HBO. God, I'm sure more people saw Cond- Condalabra this year than than they saw probably the last three or four uh, Soderbergh films, you know, simply because the audience is gigantic. Um, But it's just a different model. But anyhow, yeah, you know, I think that was troubling to him. And so, and I'm sure they do, do uh, genuinely feel, uh, you know, that something, you know, an implosion or whatever they think, uh, or however they're they're, they're approaching it is going to happen. And it could, because, you know, these things are cyclical. Like we said, you know, there could be a game changer out there. But I don't know. I still just think audiences, you know, are served fairly well by the studios. And I see these movies like R.A.P.D., Red 2, I'm looking at the rest of the summer, um, Two Guns, The Smurfs. Uh, You know, people just go to – those movies are made for people who just kind of go to the movies. You know what I mean? Um, They're just sort of the – the whatever audience. However, that whatever audience is much, 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 much bigger than, you know, this sort of us. cinephile online us audience. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're we're the minority here. So that's where the conversation gets skewed online because um, it's the minority that's talking online. You know what I mean? <laughs> if, if you go by the the social chatter, Pacific Rim is the the biggest film of the year. But of mm-hmm. course, or, or mm-hmm. the biggest film of this weekend, and of course, it's been eclipsed by Despicable Me too and um, uh, the Adam Sandler movie because you know that conversation is a little bit out of whack. An R-rated movie that I think's done pretty well this summer and was a relatively low-budgeted yet high-on-spectacle movie is um, This Is The End. Have you guys seen this movie? I never saw it. Uh, Ke- uh, Kevin, did you see it? <laughs> yeah, I did see it. I didn't like it, but I saw it. You didn't like it? Oh, man. I, no. That movie is uh, – this is the most obvious statement of this podcast. It is so self-indulgent, but – Beyond once beyond that, I found that movie really, really hilarious. But I guess what I'm saying is that I just I like that that movie's doing well because Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg fought for a making it for scaling it down, for making it like a thirty million dollar movie, and then they could right. do whatever the hell weird things they wanted, and they were allowed to be indulgent because they made you know they kept they were um, cost effective, and I I hope more of those kind of projects can come right. along. I mean, yeah, yeah. You and know, in that it, regard, sure, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, studios it's aren't looking well. over your shoulder when you're making a thirty million dollar movie. Yeah. Um, when when you know when your budget inflates to two hundred fifty million, they shut you down and then <laughs> start you back up again. And then 
your budget goes up to 250 million. <laughs> you know, that's the Lone <laughs> Ranger story. But yeah, 30 million, you know, if you're making a movie at 30 million, that's, you know, Danny Boyle calls that his, his the, that's the, the, the line that he doesn't want to be above 30. Mm-hmm. He wants to make movies for less than that, so no one's bugging him, and he can make the movies he wants to make. Well, and you also see what they're capable. Like these directors are capable of with thirty million dollars. It's kind of amazing. Like this is the end does not have the effects quality of the movies we've been talking about this whole hour, but they're they're not bad, and it gives the movie a massive sense of scale, and they're, that's well, that's I, encouraging. I think. I think that I think that when you're working with a smaller budget, it, it forces you. Um, to be a bit more creative with your logistics, with how you approach the entire thing. I think it for I think it prevents anyone from sort of running away with their imagination to the detriment of the film. I, I you know, I think, um, it, I don't know. For there's an argument to be made that that a filmmaker working with a smaller budget is almost better because they're they're forced to really look hard at what the story needs, at what the film needs, and what it really doesn't. Whereas if you have two hundred million dollars. And you know you can just spend it. Mm-hmm. You're not really thinking about what serves the movie and what doesn't because you can just sort of put it all in there. Yeah, and I hope that there is a move towards being more efficient with with the money. Yeah, like scaling things back a little bit. Like that's why the first, the very first Star Wars film was great because George Lucas couldn't do everything he wanted to do in that script. Like he had to cut back a ton of shit, mm. and it you know limitations <clears throat> create uh, encourage creativity and. I just, you know, it's 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 probably a a pointless, you know, wish to for this to happen more in in these movies, but I just wish I mean, I think they'd be better if they if they were limited a little bit, but you know, uh, as we've as we've come to the conclusion that like the audience is fully on board for these movies. Well, I mean, the other yeah. thing too is that the studios know that if an audience member is paying whatever movies cost now, I mean, it's expensive. Mm-hmm. You know, no, if you're spending fourteen, fifteen dollars, you want to get a whole fucking bunch of explosions and CGI. <laughs> no, but I mean, it sounds dumb, but you want to feel like I think the average movie person wants to feel like they spent their money and got like an experience. Yeah, yeah. no. If you're gonna go to the theater, you know? if you're gonna leave the house, yeah, you wanna you want that big scale thing you're right so if you're gonna spend another 56 more years together yeah what about me would you like to change that's another one of your can't win questions i'm not answering that what do you mean there's not one thing you'd like to change about me i'm perfect Uh, okay okay actually (laughs) one thing if i could change one thing about Uh you it would be for you to stop trying to change me you are a very skilled Mm -hmm. manipulator well i'm on to you i know how you work you think? Yeah, I know everything about you. Here we go. Let's go through here. I don't think you do, actually. <laughs> no? Yeah. Well, I know you better than I know anybody else on the planet, but maybe I that's mean, not right saying now, much. What? This is great. Right. You know, I feel yeah. close to you. Yeah. But sometimes, I don't know, I feel like uh, you're breathing helium and I'm breathing oxygen. What makes you say that? <laughs> See? I'm well, trying to on, truly connect myself. and you make a joke. <laughs> what for you guys so far in this summer season... What what stood out like beyond like they've all done you know mostly well financially but what it, what was the movie that you guys just have enjoyed the most this summer? I'm looking at movies in 2003 and or 2013 in Wikipedia and I'm looking at the, like the top ten grossing like films of the year so far and uh, there's nothing that I really enjoy there. I mean I think World <laughs> War Z was a lot better than it could it should have been which was yep. kind of cool. I think I think it. Uh, um, especially in retrospect, it's turning out to be one of the better uh, summer movies. Um, it's not that great, but it's it's definitely a lot better than than it, it's certainly not a disaster. That's how I um, feel about the whole summer. Is like everything is like I I you know enjoyed the experience of watching Star Trek Into Darkness. I mostly enjoyed Iron Man three. You know, and I'm just talking about you know, like the fun of it. Just like in the same way, Pacific Rim. I'm not going to argue is a good movie, but like I mostly enjoyed the big the bigness of it and. That's kind of the way I feel about the whole summer is like, nothing- yeah, but I don't even like, I mean, I guess you're getting more out of the summer than I am because like Pacific Rim doesn't, it hardly even qualifies for those that, uh, for me, for those things. Same with Star Trek and darkness who leaves me really empty and hollow. Totally. Total. Um, uh, Iron Man know. three adds some fun to it, like character fun that I think is interesting, but looking back, it doesn't really do a lot for me either. Man of Steel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm still kind of mixed on. I mean, I there's things I buttered I liked, things about it I didn't like, and looking back on it, it's not certainly any 
you know, I don't know. I feel, I guess I felt the way, same way I did about it. So which is some sort of half hearted. I don't know. There's nothing. This, yeah. The whole summer for me feels like I mostly enjoyed these movies. Just, just enjoyed them on a sort of visceral level in the moment, but it's like the minute yeah. you leave the theater and the more time away from these movies, the worse they become. And then they're not even really, I don't even, I don't even yeah. think they become worse. I mean, I enjoyed the experience of, of Iron Man three and world war Z. Am I in a hurry to ever revisit them? Not particularly. That's, that's I think, the thing, yeah. You know what I mean? I, I think they were sort of good in the moment that they were there, but i just not in any rush to see well, it again, or I don't I don't really linger on them too much or too hard. God, I think there's if there's one thing <clears> the studios <throat> could, like, if these movies were better, like, and more universally beloved, like, if people really love these movies that have come out this summer, um, like, we love, you know, st- the, the movies that have survived, or that have lasted, like Raiders of the Lost Ark, Jaws, you know, Back to the Future. If they made them that, if if these movies were, which it's it's hard to make a good movie. We, I mean, none of us are filmmakers, but I think we all can agree it's hard right. to make a good movie. But if it just some of them were memorable enough where you would actually want to go back to them, there's more money to be made, you know. So I just well, they, well, they do make you come back for them. They just make you go see the sequel. <laughs> that that is true. Uh, you know, God. I mean, that's You're what right. that's You're what right. it is now. I mean, that's the model. If you if you sat through it once and you enjoyed it enough, then you'll probably go see. You'll you'll maybe interested enough to see what happens next. That's really what that's really what the model is. I mean, yeah. you can, there's only so much money you can make off one movie, so you make two or three or seven, as yeah. in the case of Fast and Furious. Right, which I mean, uh, which my co-host know, would actually say is he thinks that's the best movie that's come out this summer, like the best action movie, flat out. And you know, none of us have seen it. So no, I know. Yeah, I don't no, know. What, I don't either. know what that says, but like, yeah, I'm, I think it mostly says I just don't want to spend two and a half hours with Vin <laughs> Diesel. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm I mean, curious about some of those movies because I, I'll admit I've never seen a, a Fast and Furious movie, unfortunately. Well, um, I will say I will say a friend of mine who's equally sort of ambivalent about Fast and Furious. He went to see Fast and Furious Six, and he sort of sheepishly admitted to me he was like, "It was actually a ton of fun. It was like totally stupid, like it was a dumb movie, but like on a visceral level, it was like pretty entertaining." Yeah, that stuff sort of sounds kind of interesting to me. But then like again, the, but then again, I think that's what people say about Pacific Rim, and I didn't like Pacific Rim at all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, those two leads, like Vin Diesel and 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 I, I, mean, I, I try never. I just Vin Diesel, like he's just like lead, and and Dwayne yeah. Johnson is for the most part like lead. Like those two guys leading a movie, and Paul Walker, that oh man, that uh, that walking flesh. Like what? What? What else does he do other than like open his mouth and <laughs> he's just like non actors, you know? It's just I yeah, don't know. Non entities. I will say the yeah. the fifth Fast and the Furious, which I did see because so many people told me it was awesome and I thought it was okay. But like, there's this hilarious, like blatant. You know how Top Gun has this undercurrent? Well, maybe that's not even an undercurrent of just homoeroticism you know like fast and the furious 5 is just such a hilariously homoerotic movie like the rock and uh vin diesel want to fuck each other so bad in that movie it's it's pretty amazing but yeah those movies are i i'm not into the series by any means i mean the first one is a blatant point break ripoff so i mean to me it's it's kind of amazing that that series has grown more financially successful the later it's gotten. I mean, it's it's taken this. Right, model, yeah, at one point yeah. it was almost dead, right? Like it was almost right, um, right, right. I think after dead the in the water, f- and they kind of like almost had to sort of reboot it or something. Like it was like it was the, it's found new legs in the last couple of years, right? Yeah, and it's it's interesting. Yeah. It is. It's interesting that. It's a. It's kind of a rare occurrence. It's, it's itself is kind well, it's of an fair, anomaly. It's fairly unprecedented. I mean, I don't yeah. think I can think of any franchise that's going into its seventh with like the predecessor being the biggest one i mean i can't remember the what franchise there is where the sixth movie has been the biggest of the bunch no and i don't think it's ever happened before yeah most series that that uh get to that many sequels tend to be horror movies and you know you look at like saw by the time they got to whatever six or seven like the people just were like okay we're, we're done with these movies like they they mm-hmm. stopped going so yeah it is at least in that sense, you know, I feel like we just have to footnote Fast and the Furious Six because it's it's impressive what it's doing, but it clearly hasn't gotten our attention enough. My, to... my problem with that movie is that I just I haven't seen the others, and I feel like I should see them. And like, it's not like I didn't. Well, I just missed one, and then the next thing I know, I missed another one. And <laughs> then it's like, I how am I supposed to 
I guess I you could probably yeah. just watch I mean, season I'm in the same boat, but I'm like, do I really need to know the mythology of Fast and Furious? You, you, know what you I do mean? not. I can tell you. I saw the fifth yeah. one without having seen anything else but the first one. And it, it doesn't matter. The mythology is so ridiculous that it's like, wait, who just came yeah, back from the dead? Don't, like, but just as a reasonable, like, I, like, well, I can't see six because I haven't seen any others. I should do my due diligence, right, and go and see all these. And then something else comes up, and I, you know, it always happens. Like, I have the intentions of catching yeah. up regardless of whether I'm going to like it. And I, it just doesn't happen because I get, you know, waylaid with something else. It's true. It's true. Uh, I will say that the only movie this summer that I saw twice was actually Francis Ha. Oh, yeah. I because love Francis Ha. Yeah, I mean, I saw it, um, I think, at a press screening, and then a friend of mine went, went, wanted to see it when it opened. And that was, like, for me, the most satisfying film I've probably seen all year. Francis Ha's great. I wish Kings of Summer would have gotten a little more of a financial... I just wish people would have went to see that movie, because I thought that was a really great little movie. I enjoyed that one quite a bit. I saw that movie vanished from theaters in New York. It's, I haven't got a chance to see it. It just came and went, unfortunately. It, it is unfortunate, but I do think hopefully that movie can find life, like you know, via streaming and VOD models, or just you know, people will come to it later. Because, but it, it, the the shame of it that it didn't do well in theaters is that movie actually to me was visually like it was gorgeous, and I just yeah, it looks really good. Yeah, it it, it belonged on the big screen, but it just uh, the audience didn't didn't come out for it. But it's you know, it's heartening to see something like Before Midnight playing pretty well in the summer and that movie that movie's set pieces are 30 minute dialogue scenes in a fucking hotel room you know and yeah you know I, yeah it is heartening for i mean that's a that's an adult grown-up movie you know like damn right. uh, our our um you know i don't know if our parents have seen it but it's the type of movie that our parents may would consider going to see and they're I'm really underserved, you know, yeah. um, even people who are, let's say, you know, 10, 15 years older than us. So, so yeah, they're going to go see something like that because there's almost nothing out there for them. So, you know, yeah. I'm glad that movie connected. I'm glad it did too. And, and even, I mean, I guess you could say mud was technically played into the summer. It's mud is still playing in a few theaters in Portland, which mud has me- done fantastic. Mud is probably the indie movie. Mud, yeah. mud is, I think it's done probably, it's like the, uh, What's the Paris in uh, Midnight in Paris? It's it's the Midnight in Paris of, of this year. Although yeah. it doesn't have nowhere near gross as much money, but it's done over twenty something million. It's, maybe it did really really well. Yeah, maybe it's closer to like Moonrise Kingdom did the same sort of business last year. I think. Or I think Moonrise year. actually even did more, but yeah, but uh, yeah, but it it's... still did really really well for Roadside twenty million. That's fantastic. Yeah, but Roadside is great though at taking small yeah. movies and really making them work. Like they they're just really good at that. That yeah. that is that was great to see because Mud is a movie that looks like it's actually had word of mouth and that movie's fucking great and people yeah it is it's yeah. really really good yeah and people talked about it and it's it is it's it's great to know that that can still happen you know I mean Place Beyond the Pines not a summer release but that was another one that did very well and it seemed like people were telling other people go see this movie and it worked yeah you you know um, both of those two are maybe maybe this is where. And and or, and or maybe the the appeal isn't quite as as broad and big, but um, maybe that's where the window is shrinking. Because you look at Moonrise and say Midnight in Paris, like Moonrise did like sixty million, wow. um, and uh, 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 well, sorry, it did forty five in the U.S. Okay, okay. Um, uh, it did sixty eight worldwide, and Paris, what Midnight in Paris did like hundred uh, million, uh, right? You were, yeah, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, let's see, it, well, it did. It did 56 in the oh, okay. U.S. Okay. But okay. still, those numbers are double what uh, Mud and, and Place Beyond the Pines, they, do, they did about 20 each, a little bit over yeah. 20. Then again, they're not as, I mean, Midnight in Paris is, it has a lot more broad appeal than, say, something like Place Beyond the Pines, which is really dark. It's true. Yeah. It's true. And much longer. And yeah, it's those films that we need to look at that, that do explain the the gulf in the in from the little films to the big films that does exist, but maybe that's not such a bad thing when we're getting movies of that quality and that are finding an audience. I think it's I think it is promising and, you know, I hopefully with this podcast we've sort of cut through a lot of the internet like hyperbole and the apocalyptic, you know, uh accusations or just predictions that some of these filmmakers that have existed in an old model for a long time for what they see coming. I mean, who knows if it's, if that will happen in the way that they, they mentioned, but I, um, I think, you know, it's, it's clear that the business is alive and well, and, and even the cinephiles like us are being served as well. And I, what, I guess you can't really complain too much when that's what's going on. I mean, I don't know. What yeah. I mean, at the same time, I think that golf is still going to get 
you know, bigger and bigger, but it's going to be an incremental, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like, it's slowly getting bigger and bigger where you have like those indie films doing slightly less business and the, and the blockbusters doing more. And then that's maybe where you reach a tipping point where it eventually slowly, uh, it's like global warming. It doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> right. But we also have to remember that there's going to be changes that we can't anticipate either. I mean, mm-hmm. who would have thought years ago that Netflix would be become would become like essentially an HBO? Yeah. Like they're doing TV series now. I I don't I don't think it's impossible to imagine that they might move into movies too. And so there's yeah, the technology there's gonna be, keeps keeps changing. Yeah, there's again. going to be different avenues for filmmakers too that we can't even we don't know about yet as well. So I. I think you're right. The gulf will become wider, but I think the avenues we're seeing, the kind of films that we enjoy, the sort of smaller, more character-driven films that aren't spectacles, I think we're also going to have a lot more opportunities than maybe we had before. Like, we're not just going to have to see what's playing at the art house. We can go to Netflix or go to HBO or go to yeah, absolutely. any number I, of outlets. In to general, see. I, f- I see movies more often now. Like, I was really worried, you know, I'm having a kid. <laughs> or yeah. have a kid. I have a kid. It's hard for me to see movies. But I see movies much more than I used to because I can stream everything. Yeah. Um, of course, my selection is sort of, I'm not seeing a lot of things in theaters and things, you know, I missed Mud, I missed Kings of Summer, but... I do watch a lot of movies. It's just not necessarily the uh, the ones that are in theaters right now. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think maybe another potential game changer that could come down the road is somebody's going to figure out a way to do something with VOD that's gonna that's gonna shake things up. Actually, you know, like it's been an experiment, and I like the way it's heading and the fact that it gives access to these movies to anybody, and that's great. But something I feel like a movie is going to be designed, or a series will be designed, or something that will really take advantage of what you can do when a film doesn't have to play in a theater, you know, and there, you know, mm-hmm. that hopefully that comes along, you know, we can all, we can do is just hope and wait and, and see what will shake things up a little bit. Well, with that, I think that's a great place for us to, to wrap up uh, this, this extended chat about the summer movie season. Um, you can find, uh, all, obviously, all the work that the three of us do uh, on the playlist, which is on the IndieWire blog network. Um, basically, you just Google search the playlist uh, or the playlist on IndieWire. You'll, you'll find us at the top. I wanted to thank Kevin for coming on and, and Rod as well. Thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks. All right. Thanks, man. Oh, yeah, always a good time chatting with you, and uh, we'll we'll hopefully bring this back soon, and we'll do it again soon. Okay. Cool. All right. Cheers. Bye. Later. Later.